Welcome to our Sunday worship. We gather here in Sherwood Greenlaw Church and we gather in our homes, in our workplaces, in our places of leisure to praise our God. Today we're going to think a little bit about stories and how stories build community life. I wonder what story do you tell people about your life? And what bits of that life story do you miss out? And what story would you tell about Sherwood Greenlaw Church? For stories captivate us. They can inspire us and encourage us. They can help us to solve problems and to cope with all of life's disasters. The stories that Jesus told were to enable people to imagine the kingdom of God and to see that kingdom being present in the places where they lived and worked and worshipped. So today, I invite you to listen to the story of Jesus and be touched, transformed and inspired by it. Let us worship God as we sing wherever we are. Come and find the quiet centre. Chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak, because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. 
Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Amen, and so ends the reading of God's holy word, and to him be all the glory and all the praise.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I have a friend of mine who went to be a minister in the northeast of Scotland. And in the vestibule of the church, there is a portrait of a woman. And the name of the woman is Elizabeth Clarkson. Now, Elizabeth was not a minister, just an elderly spinster who had been a member of the congregation and who, it is reckoned, once saved the church from closing. Her story is the first story you will hear about if you ever visit that congregation. Like many congregations, it had been through good and bad times. As Elizabeth's story begins, the congregation is on its knees. They couldn't afford to pay for a minister. And for all events and purposes, the congregation was really dead in the water. There was just a handful of members left, and most of them were just too old to attend worship on a Sunday morning. However, Elizabeth turns up to church every Sunday morning. She puts the lights on, opens the doors, just in case someone turns up for prayer. And at the end of the hour, she puts the lights out, closes the doors, and goes back home. She then files all the paperwork to the presbytery and she makes sure the congregation does not fall foul of the charity regulator. Against all the odds, that little church somehow survived and once again became a thriving church community thanks to the diligence, they say, of Elizabeth Clarkson. It's a little story of faithfulness and trust and loyalty. Elizabeth embodies those virtues and the congregation believes that God rewards Elizabeth's faithfulness by revitalising the congregation. It is also an important story about the power of one individual, of the importance of just ordinary members, and of course of the role of women in the church. Yet Elizabeth's heroism is attributed to the fact that she just keeps doing the same things over and over and over again. Just doing the things that she has always done like opening the doors and putting the lights on and filing the paperwork. She doesn't change anything. She simply walks faithfully until the world writes itself again. Now, all that happened over a hundred years ago and people love to tell the story about Elizabeth Clarkson. And my friend sets about his new calling in the northeast by introducing some new programme ideas to engage more with the community. And he also introduced some modern music that some of the young families had asked if they could play and sing. And folks in the congregation there tell the minister he's doing a great job. But the majority of the members don't bother to invest any time or energy into the new initiatives being introduced. The congregation just sits back, relaxes and lets the minister go on with it, just like Elizabeth Clarkson did a hundred years ago, they say. The congregation are just stuck in the past about the story about the lady who did nothing and yet helped the church to thrive. 
but my friend is stubborn. And so he decided to dig into the story about Elizabeth Clarkson. And he trolled through the minute book of the Kip session. He went to the local history section in the local library where he found a little book telling the story about Elizabeth Clarkson. And he gathered all the information he could find about his new congregation and their hero, Elizabeth Clarkson. He discovers fresh parts of the story that no one in the congregation ever mentions. For it appears that Elizabeth did not do all this work on her own. The few elderly members who were left gave sacrificially to repair their church. Elizabeth and one other reached out to some of the new families who were arriving in the area because of work at the newly built factory. And so slowly this small and dedicated group worked long and hard and raised enough money to be allowed to call a new minister to help them continue on this new part of the journey. So, why do you think that this congregation only tells a small part of its story about Elizabeth? Why do they only tell about her faithfulness in doing nothing or the same old, same old thing every day? For the clear evidence showed that far from doing nothing, Elizabeth and the little core took great risks at trying something new. She embraced people of different cultures who were coming to work in the huge new factory. She tried new things in the worship services from some of these cultural traditions. And she and the few continued to give sacrificially for a long, long time. Elizabeth herself gave nearly all her life savings just to keep the church going. So Elizabeth and the few who followed were more than just passive, waiting members, trusting in God. They were the people who engaged in the work that God was already doing in their community. And so the church flourished once more. So it was this whole message that my friend gave to the congregation. For they needed to reshape church for what was around them today. And it was the risk taking and the dedicated service that was encouraged in the church and not the sit back and wait and see what happens, which had almost shut the doors of the church again prior to his arrival. The fuller version of the church's story made more sense than the old story, don't you think? You see, there is a danger that we only remember a part of the story. And we do this because it often suits our purpose to tell it in that particular way. For it creates the outcome we want to create. I once told a remembrance parade in Kosovo when we were thinking about significant dates that 1966 was not the time how England won the World Cup. As I explained to them that the game finished to all in a draw, because England has scored a goal which actually never crossed the line, 
And then they scored another goal when fans had invaded in the pitch and they shouldn't have been allowed to do that and the game should have been stopped. So in my memory, I recall that England never won the World Cup. That's how I tell the story anyway. For my friends' congregation, the idea that they could thrive by just turning up when they fancied suited the level of commitment that a lot of people actually give to their church, which is just to appear to be faithful by turning up week in and week out. Yet does not the gospel demand so much more than that? Doesn't the gospel demand to give us our life, our soul, our all? And in our gospel reading today from Mark 1, verses 21 to 39, we glimpse a framework of Jesus' ministry in terms of casting out demons, healing and preaching and teaching and serving. This was not a one-dimensional mission, but a multifaceted mission that moved quickly from synagogue to house to the public streets. This was not a ministry of waiting faithfully and hoping, hoping that all would be well. No, Jesus' ministry was one of active engagement, healing, preaching, serving, teaching, and reflecting and praying. Ministry, in whatever form it takes, full-time word and sacrament like myself, local ordained ministry part-time, deacon or deaconess, family worker or youth worker, elder or board member, or ordinary church goer. It is all a demanding business. The role of full-time ministry of word and sacrament is not for everyone, for you need a certain temperament to cope with it. Because everyone in the congregation has an expectation about what you will do for them and how you should be a minister. But in this, in this passage, the church is moving beyond the building. Its leaders are not expected to stay in one place for too long, but to go where the needs are. And this is a dynamic that suggests that church must constantly change to meet the challenges of the day. Communities themselves grow old and change. Churches have their peaks and troughs, often in line with their communities' highs and lows. Sadly, the model of church that we hang on to and still want to believe in is the one where we stay in the building and invite others to come through the doors. Although, if truth be told, we've stopped inviting people a long, long time ago. We just want them to join the things that we like to do or that we have decided to provide for them. But when we do that, we're not creating church folks. We're creating a club that we actually like. Rather than become the people of God serving in that place, Jesus' model of ministry engaged the needs of the people. He did not do this all on his own, but he gathered others to share in his ministry. And he told them how hard and difficult that this work would be, but that they knew when they signed up for it, they were signed up to do the work of God in this particular place and time. 
And so today, as you hear this story, will you remember just the parts that suit you? Will you just remember the wee bit about Jesus going off to pray in a quiet place? Will you remember the story about Jesus healing the woman, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, who got up and then fed them all? Will you remember the crowds of people that Jesus healed and the demonics that he cast out? What will you remember of the story? It's not just one bit that counts. It's all of us that matters. We, as the people of God in this place, need to join in with the work of God in this place. Not do the things that we like, not do the things that we think make up church, but we have to seriously engage in the mission of Christ and the work that God is already doing in this place. That's what makes the church grow. That's what brings fruit for all of us. Amen. And may God add his blessing to this, the preaching of his holy word, and to him be all the glory and all the praise. Let's just take a little moment to reflect today. And I want you in your imagination to invite Jesus into your own home. And imagine him taking your hand and raising you up to be alongside him. What are you experiencing as he does this? What do you do next? Listen to the music and think about these questions on your screen. Let's take a moment as we pray together and for others. Kingdom God, we pray for peace in our hearts, that our anger and frustration is dissolved, our bitterness and resentment ceases, our lies and deceit are no more, our sins are exposed and healed. And we are lifted up in Jesus' name. Kingdom God, we pray for an end to violence, for those driven to commit murder or who seek to steal what others have. Kingdom God, we pray for families, especially those driven to destroy relationships and to make life miserable for all. May we know your love and feel your hope and experience your mercy that we can pass this on to others. Kingdom God, we pray for our church, 
and all of God's communities in Paisley and throughout the world. May they bring salt and light to the places where they serve and may they radiate your spirit to renew body and soul. We thank you, kingdom God, for making your world present down our street. May folk recognise you, honour and adore you, worship and praise you, bringing reconciliation and resolutions to our community's problems. And we summarise our prayers and we respond in the words that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We conclude our praise today as we sing our final hymn together. Fill your hearts with joy and gladness. Hymn 103. And CH four. And now may God's Spirit lift your oh. And now may God's praise lift your spirit. May God's service give you purpose. May God's love flow free in the name of Christ our Lord.